Hello, I'm Danielle Procopio, and today we'll be talking about the COVID-19 vaccine and answering some of the frequently asked questions about COVID-19. I'm excited to be joined today by two very important people of Butler Health System. First of all, Dr. David Roddinghouse, Chief Medical Officer, and secondly, Dr. Kip Beals, the Chief Innovation Officer from Butler Health Systems. Gentlemen, welcome. Can you tell us a little bit about yourselves? Sure, great to be with you today, Danielle. Um, so my name is Dave Roddinghouse. I'm an emergency medicine physician by background. Uh, so I trained in emergency medicine several years ago. And for a few years now, I've served as the chief medical officer, which uh, largely puts me over the responsibility of what happens with acute care, in particular physicians, advanced practice providers uh, within the hospital uh, here in Butler. Wonderful. And Dr. Beals. Hi, nice to be with you. Um, my name's uh, Kip Beals. I'm a family practitioner. I still see patients also, um, but uh, spend about 85% of my time working along with uh, Dr. Roddinghouse. I am uh, serving as our chief innovation officer on our administrative team, but I also am vice president for our ambulatory uh, physician uh, network, which uh, covers the same clinical uh, responsibilities, primarily in our ambulatory uh, setting, but we cross uh, pollinate work a lot together. Perfect. I know you both must be very busy on an average day, let alone during a pandemic. So we're going to jump right in and start talking with you a little bit about COVID-19 and the vaccine and what's been going on. So first of all, there's two prominent vaccines that we've been hearing about in the media, both Pfizer and Moderna. Can you tell us a little bit about the technology behind these vaccines? Sure. Um, so it's good to refresh uh, a biology class and understand what RNA is. Uh, so there's RNA and there's DNA. Um, DNA is not interfered upon with these vaccines, just to make that clear. So there's no genetic manipulation. RNA basically serves as a messenger. That's why there's the M before the RNA. And the way these were developed, um, you know, this technology has been around for a couple decades. Uh, but importantly, it was built for an exact situation like this to rapidly develop and mobilize uh, a vaccine. So the, the way the technology works uh, is that the genetic sequence of the virus, uh, they find a target on it. That genetic sequence was released in January of uh, 2020, so very early after the pandemic started. And, and at that point in time, uh, you know, we believed it was largely contained to, to China. So these companies um, grabbed the genetic sequence after it was released by the World Health Organization, and they began manufacturing targets for their vaccine. So the way it works is uh, mRNA is very, very fragile. Again, it doesn't manipulate your DNA, but what they do is they take this target identified by a genetic sequence, attach it to the RNA, and it essentially works as uh, a messenger, uh, so to speak, to your body. Um, so almost like you put a wanted sign up for, you know, a criminal, like you'd see him on, uh, you know, a telephone pole in some of the old movies. Um, that's what it's doing to your body. It's delivering to your body and to your immune system. This is what you need to look out for. This is, you know, the enemy that may enter your body. This is how you want to prevent illness is to target this for antibodies and resistance again against it. So that if and when you do see it, your body's prepared to fight it off. Um, so it's remarkable technology. Again, it's, you know, it's been around for uh, some time and the essential ingredients of it is it's very fragile. You can't store it at room temperature, which is why there's cold and ultra cold required storage. And they wrap it in basically fat that dissolves as soon as it gets in your body. The mRNA gets released. mRNA is degraded very quickly in your body. It delivers its uh, signal and it bugs out pretty fast. So the technology again is, uh, is amazing. Um, it seems like it was developed very quickly, but this is a platform and a tool that, um, you know, biotech companies have had for quite some time, just ready for the right situation to really uh, prove what it can do. And thankfully, that technology is available to us at this point in time and, and a very critical time for all of us. Um, and you did say that, you know, things did move very quickly and the vaccine was approved very quickly. So is it safe? This, this technology has uh, been studied as extensively and really uh, in the same pattern that all vaccines are studied. And it is uh, fortunately a very safe vaccine. 
uh, the, the whole genomic sequencing that Dr. Roddinghouse is referring to allowed us to kind of have this advance quickly. And I think that's the main thing that I hear from patients that they talk about, well, this, didn't it go too fast? In fact, um, you know, we're, our expectation is, uh, God forbid, we have another uh, pandemic in the near future that this type of uh, ramp up towards time of recognition to production is months rather than uh, near a year that it took this time. The genetic sequencing actually was recognized and identified within 10 days of the first diagnosis of pneumonia in Wuhan. And then what happened is that there was a rapid uh, uh, recognition that we were in a situation that could be very serious. And that's why we heard of Operation Warp Speed and other initiatives around the world where data was being shared uh, around the world. And then it also was an opportunity for the governments uh, typically around the world and in private sector to, uh, if you will, support financially and invest in the rapid uh, development of this technology. Those resources not only allowed um, several companies that make vaccine to become early adopters of this and, and get involved very early with the production of potential candidates, but it also gave us multiple platforms to develop um, different kinds of vaccines in the hope that we would make sure that we covered the bases in case one didn't work out. Um, I think that we realized that the financial risk that was taken away enabled um, uh, many companies and many scientists and, and uh, companies and, and experts around the world to come together. And I think that's what really made the big difference. The phase one, two, and three trials that occurred also were able to be stacked a little bit. That means they were done sometimes together um, at the same time so that we would, because the efficiencies and cost impact that that was going to have was otherwise taken away from the equation and allowed this um, appropriate and rapid uh, response. That's very wonderful. Safe Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's it's so good to hear that it's safe because I know there have been so many concerns with with uh, in the public with the speed with which the vaccine was put together. So it's it's good to hear that it's something that's safe that can that it can protect us from COVID nineteen. Um, do you have any idea how many Americans have been vaccinated so far? Yeah, so you know, as Dr. Beals was saying, the the development has been quick. Um, and you know the the rollout. You know I know there's frustrations with the number of people that have been vaccinated so far, but when you look in the grand scheme of things, and when the vaccine was available, when it received uh, emergency use use authorization, so it's not fully FDA approved yet. The FDA uh, you know moved quickly to get this vaccine out in the market. Um, per the CDC's website, uh, as of yesterday, there were 72 million Americans that have been. Uh, or that uh, doses, excuse me, that have been distributed, 56 million Americans uh, have received at least one dose, and I have 15 and a half million have received both doses, which is believed at this point in time to be required for, uh, you know, full protection or full immunity uh, about 10 to 14 days after that second dose. So numbers are still pretty impressive, uh, you know, at this point in time and this early in the game. Absolutely. So if someone wants to get the vaccine, how can they go about getting it? And what should they know before they receive the vaccine? Well, what they should know is how their individual state or you know, region is handling the assignment of the vaccine. So in the state of Pennsylvania, we have different categories. Um, you know, the state of Pennsylvania itself targeted healthcare workers first. So, you know, guys like myself and Dr. Beals who are providing direct patient care And they made that allocation based on the belief that hospitals would need to be able to preserve employees, workers, healthcare people, and, you know, continue to staff. Um, If you recall at the time that release of vaccine, our numbers were still very high. We were in the middle of a a big national surge. So they targeted healthcare workers first, and then they moved into what they called, uh, you know, additional 1A. And that included an, an older population. And then they adjusted 1A again, and that was really anybody over the age of 16 um, and 16 to 64 in particular that had uh, a certain number of medical issues. So first, you know, understand what the target of your individual state, in this case, obviously, Pennsylvania and your region, what they're targeting. And then the best way is to go to the Pennsylvania Department of Health website and identify who is giving vaccine 
Um, we have a website where we encourage people to sign up if they meet the requirements uh, for vaccination at this point in time. We've also engaged uh, Center for Community Resources in Butler and Area on Aging. Um, health systems right now are some of the major vaccinators because of the difficulty with storage and logistics of the two available vaccines at this point in time. As that expands, I anticipate there will be multiple other avenues to you know, seek out vaccination. But at this point, it's primarily web-based, just so we can keep track of numbers and scheduling. And then there are some uh, phone capability uh, as well. But knowing if you're eligible um, and where you stand in the eligibility is very important right now. I know there's a lot of confusion over that and vaccinators have been forced to make decisions and priorities. You know, we strongly believe that that class of 1A, everybody needs vaccine and everybody needs protection, as do teachers and many other folks. So we'll just continue to push it out as quickly as we can. But we try to keep our information available to the public, who's eligible, who we're targeting and how to access scheduling and access vaccine. Absolutely. And I know that um, the states are working really hard to get the vaccine in the hands of the people that need it and want it as quickly as possible, but it's been quite an undertaking uh, for all of the states. And um, when do you think we'll be at a point that the vaccine will be available to anyone that wants it? Well, you know, we, uh, we've seen that kind of shift over time about how, when do we think it's all you know, going to be available. We know that there, and I'm sure that you've heard about some of the other products from Johnson & Johnson and others that are being considered right now. I think our best guess right now is that by this summer, maybe July and August, I think we're going to be uh, in a world where that kind of uh, availability will be uh, realized. Perfect. Now, you mentioned Johnson & Johnson. Uh, it sounds like Johnson & Johnson is next in line to receive emergency authorization from the FDA. How does the Johnson & Johnson vaccine differ from the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine? Yes, yeah, so a good question. Um, so as we talked about, the Pfizer and Moderna are mRNA-based technology. And what the Johnson & Johnson vaccine does is it piggybacks off of what's called an adenovirus. So one thing we know about viruses is they are absolute experts at getting into humans and causing infection. So their entry into the body and their entry into human cells, um, you know, is a disadvantage, but at the same time, an advantage. So this vaccine piggybacks off an inactivated, meaning not live and can't make you sick, adenovirus, which is a very, very common circulating virus, typically stuffy nose, cough, congestion, that sort of thing. Um, and so it puts the target on this virus. The virus, again, itself is inactivated. It can't cause illness in your body. But again, just like that wanted sign, it presents to your body, this is what you're looking for, and this is your target, and this is what you need to fight off. One of the biggest differences, though, and in, in why I think J&J &J and, and some others will be game changers is Pfizer uh, BioNTech vaccine has to be stored ultra cold. Um, and very few people have freezers to handle that. Health systems just happen to have them because of storage of other uh, things. Moderna has to be refrigerated. J&J &J has a shelf life um, you know, that is at least five months. And it's liquid at room temperature and it's room temperature storage. So if you're looking worldwide at treating this pandemic and then distribution to multiple other sites, even remote sites across the United States, this is a game changer. This is exactly what you want because you can ship it worldwide. You can deploy it in multiple places. It's also a single dose. Um, so again, you know, it stands to really change the distribution methodology once it becomes widely available. But if you're in other countries that don't have this technology forefront and don't have access to Pfizer and Moderna, this is a one where you're really targeting and saying we may not have the infrastructure to store the two uh, you know, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Once J&J &J is available though, we can really get this rolling uh, across our country. And if you look at, you know, it's, pandemic means it's across the world. So anywhere there's a threat of disease spreading, we need to address that, um, not just from a moral and ethical standpoint, but from a public health and, and prevention standpoint. So you can't eradicate a pandemic just treating it in one country. This is a, a worldwide approach that we have to have. And the J&J &J vaccine offers promises to other candidate vaccines that we can deploy worldwide. 
Absolutely. And it's great to see that that technology is evolving and that we're utilizing different techniques for administration and that you're seeing different options for the vaccine. So we will be able to vaccinate more and more people as we uh, progress. Um, but for right now, if you are in the group that's eligible for the vaccine, you're really restricted to the choice of Pfizer or Moderna. Um, and as someone who needs to be vaccinated, are you able to request one or the other? Can I come in and tell my physician or tell the clinic that I would prefer one one uh, brand over the other brand? Yeah, that's a, a, another good question. A lot of people want to know that. And um, uh, right now, the way the delivery comes in and the way we're doing it now is there is not a, it's not a menu and you, and you choose at this point. We get delivery of uh, a product and then we uh, open up scheduling and uh, people line up and that's what's happening all across the country. So uh, the, the choice of uh, the exact vaccine that you get at this point is, is not um, uh, an option at this point. We always have to ask just to make sure so that viewers viewers sure. know what to expect when they come out. Um, so when we're looking at polls, what we're seeing is that roughly two thirds of the U.S. population wants to receive the vaccine. And I know, uh, again, the media is talking a lot about herd immunity and what it's going to take for us to get over, you know, the hill here to, to return to some version of normal. So um, tell us a little bit about what you think it's going to take for us to achieve herd immunity and to reduce uh, or potentially eliminate this pandemic? Well, I, I think the most important thing about understanding uh, uh, herd immunity is the best way for us probably to get there is through vaccinations. You know, getting, gaining herd immunity through natural spread of infection really runs the risk of a lot of mortality and a lot of um, uh, prolonged um, agony for, I think, our globe. I think that uh, to Dr. Roddinghouse's point uh, with regards to some of these other uh, platforms that this vaccine is going to be able to get distributed in ways that don't require these specialized uh, storage and whatnot are really promising and really going to help us get to that point. The exact number of how many people need to get um, vaccinated or um, have been infected, uh, you know, you hear that if you look that up, you'll see that there is some variation. You know, I think it can go from 70 up to 90. Typically, Dr. Fauci and uh, others who speak uh, frequently on this topic uh, have landed around the 80 percent mark. We think that that's about right. Fortunately, um, it's close to the two thirds number that uh, we think people are going to be um, uh, willing to get the vaccine. And then certainly uh, people who uh, aren't getting the vaccine, uh, who will be running the risk of getting infected anyway, will be contributing to those ultimate numbers. Absolutely. So hopefully we'll get there sooner rather than later. Fingers crossed. I know that a lot of um, people, you know, in the public as well as even in the medical community have been talking a lot about the variants of COVID-19 that are being seen worldwide, specifically when we look at what's going on in the UK and in South Africa. And there's been a lot of questions as to whether or not the vaccines that are available to us right now can actually protect us against those um, more contagious variants. Do we have any evidence or data that can tell us what the vaccine can do for us uh, if we're exposed? to one of those variants? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I anticipate that will come up more often as time goes by. So, you know, there's a number of things that uh, viruses do predictably. Uh, one is spread and two is mutate. So even in flu and, and other viruses, we see mutations very, very commonly. And the order or the magnitude with which they mutate is often very impressive. Um, so it's not surprising at all to see mutations. Um, you know, it's no surprise to know that these mutations are in our country now and even in our uh, neck of the woods here in Butler County. Um, we don't do enough genetic sequencing in this country, um, you know, to this point. I know it's picking up, but as we do that, we will find more and more variants. And some of the mutations will be meaningful, meaning they can spread more easily. Some of them we, uh, you know, we hope will not cause increased uh, sickness or, you know, uh, severity of, of illness. And, you know, one thing we don't want is that target that our vaccines are going after uh, to change or, you know, for a major mutation to happen there. But, you know, to really uh, address the question, um, the other variants that we found, uh, we have to define what we're trying to do. So when you see the data published in Moderna and Pfizer and J&J, &J, so J&J &J is uh, about 66% effective. 
Moderna and Pfizer after second dose are in the mid 90s, um, almost unheard of rates that you'd only see with a, a truly incredibly effective vaccine like measles. Um, those are measures of if I get the vaccine, then I don't get the virus. Our targets are really uh, in something like this. We want to reduce number of deaths. We want to reduce severity of infection. And one of the goals may not ultimately be elimination of this virus, but containment of this, this virus such that our immune systems are prepared through vaccination that when we get it, if we do get it, it's a very mild infection. So, you know, maybe a little bit of runny nose, a cough, common cold. We know that we have a handful of circulating coronaviruses from the same family that are with us every winter. Um, you know, anytime you get a stuffy nose, a cough, a sort of sinus infection, chances are it's an adenovirus, it's a coronavirus. So if we can reduce this virus to that level and really target severe illness and death, then we're gonna be in very good shape. And the good news so far is all the preliminary data coming out against these variants and vaccinated people is it is highly effective at reducing severity of illness. That is great news uh, with all the, you know, death, morbidity, hospitalizations that we've seen. Absolutely. So when we're talking about efficacy, we know that the Johnson and Johnson vaccine does have a lower efficacy than the Pfizer or Moderna. So um, knowing that, should I be concerned if I receive the Johnson and Johnson vaccine as opposed to Pfizer or Moderna? Well, you know, given uh, the eff efficacy rate, I, I wouldn't be too concerned. You know, again, we have to define what is our target here. Our target is reduction of severity of illness. We're not going to prevent every illness, and chances are there will be mutations that may evade vaccines. But if the vaccine is effective at preventing severe illness, hospitalization, and, you know, certainly death, then um, that is really good news. So when you look at an efficacy rate of 94, 95 percent from, you know, Pfizer and Moderna, so incredible. So the chances of me getting COVID if I'm exposed to it after full vaccination is only four or five percent. That's almost unheard of. So the, the efficacy that we're seeing is outstanding. But again, we really need to define our targets. So don't get hung up on those numbers so much. Get hung up on the concept that I'm getting a vaccine that's effective at really keeping me from getting very sick. And especially if I have other you know, comorbidities and medical illnesses, diabetes, heart disease, on and on, that is excellent news. Um, so what I want is if there's a threat, I don't want to get too sick. I don't want to end up in the hospital. I don't want complications that may spill into complications of other illnesses and medical conditions I have. So um, I think the message to the public is as soon as we can get vaccine out, um, you know, once we have a, a reliable safety profile for it, take it, take what you can get. Um, as Kip described, you know, we may not have an a la carte menu, choose your vaccine today. Um, but I'm extremely confident the CDC and the FDA will continue to strongly vet these vaccines, be very comfortable with their safety before they put them out, and um, that they will be effective. Yeah, absolutely. Now, do we have any idea how long the protection from the vaccine lasts? So we know that uh, once we get it, we are going to have very high efficacy rates. We know that, um, you know, we are most likely going to be safe from the dangers of COVID. But how long can I expect my, my vaccination to last? Is it going to be like a flu shot that I have to get every year? Or is it going to be one and done? Yeah, um, it's more like what you're saying that it may be either of those we we don't really know um we 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 believe that by having exposure to this vaccine should behave like most of the other uh, vaccines and that you get some coverage for months and months sometimes even if it if it mutates enough like that's why we have flu shots every year we get flu shots every year because there's enough variation from the one from the previous year that we recognize that this allows us a better chance of covering people's um, uh, uh, vulnerabilities to this and decreases death. And I think it's it's important to highlight that uh, the David, the Dr. Roddinghouse's point around um, the reason we're doing this program, and that is to decrease the number of people that get sick, decrease the morbidity and the mortality and the deaths and severe illness associated with this and keep people out of hospitals. The main purpose right now is not eradication of this disorder. This disease is not disappearing tomorrow because of vaccine. 
we want to disappear death. We want to make sure that we're working towards decreasing people who get severely ill and have those side effects and, and uh, problems that uh, Dr. Roddenhaus was uh, mentioning. So I think with this one, we don't know. We're going to have to wait and see what happens. And they'll be studying that along. There may be boosters. There may be a reason that it'll become next or someday maybe you'll be getting your COVID uh, flu vaccine. And we'll find that out as we go along. There's, that's been a lot of this with COVID. It's just been kind of as we, we're all learning together as the pandemic has progressed. Um, so if, if you did have COVID, if you're someone who unfortunately was uh, positive for COVID, should you be vaccinated? The answer is yes. So um, we do know a couple things. And, you know, as you alluded to, the acceleration of information, learning about this virus and the pandemic um, has been one of the real bright lights of, uh, you know, what otherwise is a really, really tough situation. Um, and I can, you know, give you anecdotes early on in the spring, the dissemination of medical information, learning on the fly, how best to treat patients, what works, what doesn't work. Um, you know, the internet uh, and, you know, social media have been absolutely remarkable in that spread of information. You know, even our colleagues in China and other countries across the globe, certainly out of Europe, those early learning experiences were incredible. Um, but to get back to your question, this will further be sorted out, I, I believe, in terms of um, you know, how soon and when. The answer right now is if you had COVID uh, and you had a diagnosed infection, what we want you to do is uh, wait until you fully recover and at least your quarantine period is over, uh, assuming you have a mild illness. Um, if you have a more severe illness, then um, you, know, you need to wait until you get somewhat better. You typically have about a 90 day window um, that, you know, that window may be extended based on more information. Uh, and again, we do know your body develops a very strong immunity and strong immunogenic response once you've been infected. But to really directly answer the question, which I know I've been delaying, if you had COVID before, we do want you to get vaccinated because we believe that it's important to solidify that within your immune system develop a very mature and robust immune response so that if and when you see it again, your body is prepared. But we want you to wait until you've uh, gotten out of quarantine at least and until um, you know, you're, you're safe to get it. Um, again, you can delay it up to 90 days. Um, the CDC is actually starting to encourage people to move it up a little bit sooner, but you do have protection you know, for that window of time uh, until you get vaccinated. So if you just had it a month ago, you've got a couple of months that you can wait and, you know, get vaccinated. Perfect. So I know we've talked a little bit about patients that you may have seen uh, throughout the pandemic and having some of those underlying health conditions such as diabetes, heart disease, um, obesity. So what underlying, if I have an underlying health condition, um, am I still able to get the vaccine? Are there any of those, those health conditions that might prevent me from being vaccinated? Most of the time, when we see people with health care conditions or other specific medical problems, we're finding that those are exactly the people that we want to get vaccinated. We want to see them getting it because they are the ones that are, in fact, at higher risk for having problems. Uh, when Dr. Roddinghouse is working in the emergency room, the people that he's seen that come in that are very sick certainly can be of any age and um, have uh, you know, any combination of, of medical problems or not. But the vast majority of them are the elderly and people with these what we call comorbid um, diagnoses. So we definitely are encouraging people. And there are uh, you know, messages out there about certain concerns. There are certain problems, especially when it comes down to immunosuppressed patients. Even though they are still um, uh, encouraged to have this vaccine, their doctors who are treating them for specific problems may want to weigh in because that's perhaps if there is any kind of future platforms of vaccine that incorporate increasing amounts of um, live portions of vaccine or, or, or um, virus that sometimes puts people uh, at a little bit higher risk, then there may be some modification on which one they get. They may have that menu that uh, we were alluding to earlier. But other than that very small segment of population, the vast majority of people that are in fact immunosuppressed, have heart disease, have diabetes, uh, we want them, those are the exact people that are included in this 1A and 1B groups 
uh, that should be, um, uh, if not now, will be in the next grouping that we want to make sure get the vaccine. Very good. So as these people are coming out to get their vaccines, are we seeing any side effects? Have you seen patients getting sick as a result of being vaccinated? What should we know as, uh, as patients? Yeah. So what we should know is that uh, the side effects tend to be very minimal. Um, so just like you get with a flu vaccine, we're seeing local soreness. You know, it is in your deltoid, which is the muscle that sits, you know, just on the side of your shoulder. Shot goes right in there. Um, it is a very tiny, very thin needle. Most of the time, people don't feel anything. Um, but with the first shot, if you haven't had COVID previously, it's generally very well tolerated. A little bit of local soreness, maybe some body aches, what we'd call myalgias, occasionally a couple swollen lymph nodes in the area. Generally, uh, again, very well tolerated. Um, it's the second dose that we tend to see more uh, effects with. And um, some of those are expected. Uh, now go back to the first dose. If you had COVID previously, because your body will recognize that vaccine and that target as an enemy, your body may more, you know, mount more of a, an immunogenic response to it. So say I had COVID a month ago, I get my vaccine, my first dose, I may react more because my body's already primed to respond to that, which is great. That's what we want. So first dose, the second dose, if you haven't had COVID, the second dose typically produces more, you know, arm soreness, muscle soreness, um, occasionally a little bit of swelling, sometimes some swollen lymph nodes. We do occasionally see fever, sometimes some chills and body aches. The vaccine has not given you COVID. Uh, the vaccine is having its intended effect, which is to tell your body, we're showing you this again. This is your enemy. You need to be able to fight it off. What we don't want people to have, um, and which draws concern, is you know cough, shortness of breath, runny nose, sore throat. Those are not normal effects of the vaccine. Those need to be investigated. Um, we do turn our patients to um, uh, not an app, but an online registering process with the CDC uh, called VSAFE. So we encourage them to you know, register with that. It's very simple, did it myself. And then it prompts you not just for your second uh, vaccine date after you get your first, it also checks in on you. And that feeds into a larger database that helps us collect information on what is the frequency of side effects? What are side effects that maybe we didn't you know, anticipate that we can inform future patients for as they receive vaccines? But um, overall, th these are, are very, very well tolerated. Um, and you know, the, the severe reactions, we're, we're just not seeing them uh, you know, immediately. And that's good to hear because there was so much coverage initially of the allergic reactions that should that we were uh, concerned about. Um, so typically, you're not seeing severe allergic reactions with those that are vaccinated, or have you seen any? Well, I, I personally have not seen any patients uh, with it. It's it's uh, extremely rare. Uh, when we look at the the numbers and the data around it, it's it's you know single digits. It's you know out of a million people will have what is decided to be called an allergic reaction. When you read the data, some of it is even kind of borderline about whether that was really an allergic reaction. So, uh, you know, the things that we are really reassured about as clinicians that are recommending this vaccine is the lack of um, true uh, severe allergic reactions or the, the, the amazingly small numbers of it. I mean, to Dr. Roddenhouse's point that, you know, people are going to have varying degrees of these kind of reactions. But again, we want to highlight like uh, he did, which is that if you have a day or two of these minor um, swellings and aches and chills, that's not you getting sick. That's your body saying, I have something that is I'm responding to. And that's actually a normal response to the vaccine. If it lasts more than a couple of days or you have those kind of severe symptoms that he talks about, shortness of breath, you know, high fevers, um, severe coughs, that's a different story. You need even if you got a vaccine, uh, you need to get checked out because that would be a rare combination of possibilities. But even more common, however, than it would be to have an allergic reaction. Absolutely. That's very comforting for those that have been concerned then about those reactions, that that's not as common as maybe what one might think. I know one of the populations that has received a lot of attention in the media and also um, in the healthcare community 
is pregnant women. And so there's been a lot of questions and back and forth about whether or not the vaccine is safe for women that are pregnant, um, whether or not women who are breastfeeding should be getting the vaccine. Um, so what can you tell me about uh, vaccination for women who are pregnant or breastfeeding? And, and if we choose to get vaccinated, is there any known effect on fertility? Right. Those uh, those questions are out there. And uh, we began asking them ourselves very early on. And we actually talked to our specialty folks on that in that field um, all the time to make sure about where that's going. What was very reassuring is that the, the people who specialize in, in pregnant or lactating um, women uh, were actually some of the first specialists to raise their hand to say, yes, we want this vaccine offered to these patients, these people, these women who are pregnant and or trying to get pregnant or who are presently lactating and breastfeeding. Again, we want to highlight this does not affect genetic DNA. It doesn't get into what we call the nucleus, which is where that whole genetic action is occurring. Um, so we want to be reassuring. And at the same time, we know that um, a lot of the studies that go on with these phase one, two, and three trials on vaccines we don't we don't create we don't perform testing on these uh, patients so the safety uh, concerns are valid concerns we we respect them uh, when we're offering vaccine to them uh, there's never any um, shame or guilt if they decide against it we keep them informed about the safety the efficacy um, our belief that this is really helpful and what's important to note is that in the pregnant population in particular um, it's known that there is more morbidity and more problems associated with even influenza. And that's why this group of specialists and, and high-risk pregnancy experts uh, you know, wanted to emphasize that they do want these people to get vaccinated because there is um, in healthy um, women who are pregnant, uh, more problems often uh, associated with the, the influenza and other illnesses. Um, so we're translating that into also with our COVID coronavirus. So uh, we're, we're, we're going to offer, we're going to continue to encourage and reassure that we believe it's safe and it's the right thing to do and it will not affect fertility. There's never been a study that's proven any fertility issues. It doesn't make any scientific correlative to us, but we understand the question and we're reassured by the fact that it is not uh, affecting the DNA in any way. Very good. Um, so I've heard another rumor that I'm hoping you might be able to, to put to rest. I've heard that if you have COVID and you have a heart condition, that you should not get the vaccine. Um, and to me, that seems a little counterintuitive. So can you, can you tell me which is it? Am I supposed to get vaccinated? Am I not to get vaccinated if, I, if I've tested positive and I have a heart condition? What, what should I do, doctors? Yeah, so I appreciate you addressing rumors. Um, that, that would definitely be a rumor. Um, as you said, it doesn't really seem to, to pass the logic test. So uh, if, you know, if you do have COVID and you have a heart condition, certainly before you get vaccinated, you want to recover first. So you want to get out of that quarantine and that acute illness phase. But, you know, just like Dr. Beal said, if there's a target population, then, you know, people with heart disease, especially severe heart disease, uh, are you know, a population that we want to target. We want to prevent severe illness and certainly hospitalizations uh, in that category of patient and with those uh, conditions. So, you know, there, there are some unknowns about this disease and some of them are, um, why does it cause blood clots and why does it cause, you know, certain other vascular conditions? As we sort that out, we've learned how to treat them and how to, you know, mitigate uh, adverse effects from those when patients are in the hospital, and, and certainly we've gained a lot of information about it. What are the long-term effects on heart and lungs? There's some mystery behind that, but we do find the vast majority of people recover. Uh, but definitely back to your, you know, your point, people who have severe medical problems and then have heart lung problems, once they recover, if they had COVID, they should absolutely get vaccinated. Excellent. Thank you for telling us the truth on that one. So now I know what, what to share. Um, another thing that I've been hearing a lot is questions about once I'm vaccinated, am I safe? Am I allowed to return to life as normal? So what should I do after vaccination? Do I still need to wear my mask? Should I still be social distancing? Or is it time to have that birthday party? <laughs> well, I'm not going to discourage every birthday party. Um, <laughs> but birthday parties can still be done safely. 
so, you know, the answer to that question really lies in uh, something that we don't know. And that's if, if I am vaccinated, can I get the virus, not get sick from it, but still give it to other people? Um, you know, so can I generously spread this virus if I'm vaccinated where I don't get sick, but I may infect lots and lots of other people that I come in contact with? And until we answer that question and we really get COVID under control in our population, um, you know, that birthday party, you're going to have to have masks. Yes, you're going to have to wash your hands. Um, you know, you're going to have to be uh, very careful if you're sick and not expose yourself to people. Um, so we're going to have to continue all those measures that have been, you know, very successful and that we know work, uh, you know, at this point in time. So uh, my guess is we'll continue to gain more information on this. We'll really start to answer those questions of, you know, what we would call an asymptomatic carrier where I have the virus. I'm protected, but I can make other people sick until we start to answer some of those questions and really get a grasp of how this is spread, you know, post vaccination, um, then we're going to have to continue those measures. Um, you know, just sort of a, a nice data point for you and, and for people to know, we know those things work. Um, you know, we encourage a lot of hand washing. We encourage hand washing in the hospital, as you can imagine. Um, but with these measures, Typically at this time in our state, we would have seen hundreds of thousands of cases of flu. Uh, we are as a state sitting under 600 cases uh, for, for this year. Um, so it's a, it's a wonderful public health success story. We've really kept a lot of people who otherwise would get sick uh, out of the hospital. And um, so we know these things work. As long as we keep doing them and have a bit of patience till the rest of it gets sorted out, we're going to be just fine. Very good. And hopefully people will continue that hand washing and some of these practices past the pandemic so that we do have better flu seasons ahead of us. I think, like you said, we definitely learned some some good public health lessons uh, as a result of the pandemic. So as we're getting ready to wrap things up, do either of you have any final thoughts to share with the community about COVID-19? I'll, I'll take a stab at it and I'll let David uh, uh, anchor. Um, you know, I think that the main point that we should end with is, you know, keep an open mind about the vaccine. We've maybe done a little bit of a, we've not done as good a job historically around demystifying vaccines in general for years. And um, it has a proven track record. Um, and I think that we do want to be able to reassure people of the safety of these. I think that you're seeing a lot of um, uh, actions by public figures and specialists and experts and scientists and all sorts of um, folks across our society talking about vaccine, getting the vaccine publicly. Um, both of us have had the vaccine our, and uh, we recommend that to our own families, our mothers and our fathers and our grandmas. And we would um, encourage people to keep an open mind and keep thinking about it if they've been reluctant so far. And I think the big anchoring thing is those safety measures. Please, uh, you know, regardless of what you think about the, uh, you know, the masks, you know, there's some studies that really show the benefit of that. And so we know that the hand washing, the masking, the distancing, the keeping your hands away from your face, these things um, we know make a big difference. And we think that when you look at what's happening with the flu this year, that that's uh, given some uh, credibility to those discussions. Dr. Roddenhouse? Absolutely. Well, you stole all my thunder. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think uh, it's, been, it's been a really, you know, long trying year for a lot of people. Um, I, you know, it, it, until we can get back to really that sort of normal and gathering and being together, um, there are things that we recognize that have uh, worsened in, you know, isolation and people being solitary, depression, anxiety, all those things, you know, certainly we're well aware of in the uh, healthcare space. Um, we encourage people to reach out to any resources they have and to seek out help, um, you know, earlier rather than later. Um, you know, it's not been a time where we could rely on friends and family and others quite as much. But everybody is human and humans are social creatures. We need contact, we need interaction, we need um, 
you know, uh, discussion, we need to feel accepted in society. We are, you know, congregating creatures. We are not uh, isolated creatures uh, by nature. So seek out friendships, seek out, you know, human interaction, find uh, help and find resources, you know, if and when you need them, we encourage that earlier, you know, rather than uh, later or postponing things. Um, healthcare facilities are very safe. We uh, are very practiced at this now. Um, I can guarantee you our hand washing and mask compliance is outstanding. We're very accustomed to dealing with this when you need help and, and if you need us, do not delay emergencies, do not delay things, whether it's mental health, whether it's physical health. If you think you have an issue that needs to be addressed, we can address it in a very safe and meaningful fashion. The last thing we want is people putting off care that is, is absolutely necessary. And I think also, you know, find trusted sources when it comes to COVID. Um, you know, we've been battling a misinformation campaign from, you know, multiple directions for a long time. As the mysteries of this illness unfolded and we really figured out what we were dealing with and how to prevent it and how to treat it, um, you know, there's, there's very reliable information out there, uh, both on vaccines and, and, and on disease. Um, but, you know, lean on the trusty, uh, trustworthy resources uh, or sources and, you know, find the resources that you need, uh, no matter what it might be. Absolutely. And I want to thank both of you for taking time out of your schedule today to be those trusted resources for us and shed some light on what's going on with the pandemic and especially specifically with the COVID-19 vaccination. I think everyone's going to learn a lot from this information. I certainly know that I did. So again, I would like to say thank you to Dr. David Roddinghouse and Dr. Kip Beals from Butler Health System. Thank you for joining me. I'm Danielle Procopio and I want to thank everyone for watching.